Our initial speaker this morning has attracted considerable attention both here in the United States and abroad by virtue of his meticulous and detailed study of the history of Western aid to the Soviet Union. As a research fellow at the Hoover Institute on War, Revolution, and Peace at Stanford University, he researched, wrote, and had published a three-volume series entitled Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development, a shocking, irrefutable history of American and other Western nation aid in the creation of what we identify today as our adversary superpower, the Soviet Union. Within the last two years, he has written the books National Suicide, Military Aid to the Soviet Union, and Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. Two weeks ago, his newest book, Wall Street and FDR was published and is now available. And on the front burner today, which he is exhaustively working on, is another volume called Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler. With all of this work, which has encompassed better than a decade, he has also found time to write articles for a review of the news, human events, and National Review. Born in London, educated in England, Germany, and the United States, he became a citizen of the United States in 1962. He was a professor of economics at California State University before joining the Hoover Institute, and now resides in Northern California with his wife Betty and their family. It is a privilege for me and an honor for all of us to have with us today Professor Anthony C. Sutton. Tony? Thank you very much. My assignment this morning is a virtually impossible task. I have 50 minutes to summarize 15 years of research and half a dozen books. What I propose to do is outline the story of our construction of the Soviet Union. I will start the outline in 1917 and bring you down to the present day chronologically. But this outline is a framework, it's a mere skeleton of the whole story. But what I will do is draw your attention to the nature of the published evidence, and I hope you will excuse me if I rely mostly on my own books, because that's the evidence I know best. This, of course, is in the true nature of a seminar. It's my job to point the way. And it's yours, if you wish, to pick up the threads and assemble the facts into a mosaic. From time to time this morning, I will refer to unpublished evidence and research yet to be undertaken. We do not yet have the full story. In other words, I will point out the gaps. This is important because if you push the argument beyond the limits of the evidence at hand, the inevitable result is a loss of credibility. Now, the best way to introduce my topic is to make a point about information in a socialist society. This is a sophisticated audience. You know about distortion and suppression and elimination of the facts. We live in a socialist society. And suppression of information is typical of such societies. To eliminate freedom, one must first eliminate widespread knowledge of the truth. So I submit to you that today in the United States there are three levels of information. The first level, we could call the establishment version. It's what most people have believed in the past to be true about events and history. 
The difference today compared with, say, a decade ago is that the credibility of the establishment has been shattered. People in general no longer believe in Washington or anything that comes out of Washington. So this first level is what the government or the establishment wants you to know. Only coincidentally is it the truth. The criteria they use are two, I suggest. One, they say, what do we want them to know? And secondly, they say, is it consistent with what we told them last time? And sometimes they slip up and then the statements become inoperable. Then we have the second level of information sometimes called the revisionist level. It challenges the first level, but it's still based on documents and information released by the bureaucrats and politicians in Washington. It does not get to the root of the problem. It doesn't get to the root of the problem because it relies mainly on facts which they decide can be released. I would suggest, and I hope you won't take this unduly critically, that the critics of the Kennedy assassination probably fall within this category. There's no question they're onto something. But they're still at the second level because they rely on information which it has be, been decided can be released. They will not get to the third level until they get all the information within government files, and that, I understand, may take 75 or 100 years. Then we get to the third level, and I suggest that presumably almost everybody or everybody in this room is operating or wants to operate on the third level. It is based on new documentary evidence that has to be rooted out from the research viewpoint. You have to know where to look. You have to know about its existence. You have to demand it. You have to get it declassified. You must accept, when you're in my position, that when you initially publish it, most people will not believe you. They will not believe you because the establishment version got in there first, and the mess of the media, and I'm not blaming the media for this, got behind it and publicized what they believe to be the truth. But we're now getting a number of very solid, substantial books written on this third level. I'll give you some quick examples. A Colin Simpson, The Lusitania, an attempt to bring the United States into World War I, documented. Julius Epstein, Operation Keelhaul. A very new book by Guy Richards, uh, The Rescue of the Romanovs. The Tsar was not murdered, as the establishment would like you to believe. From the liberal side of things, uh, I would suggest Jules Archer, the plot to seize the White House. So, I emphasized this morning that my outline is going to be at the third level. It's based on authentic and original documentation, mostly from government files. It is directly and verifiable evidence. I always make the citations and the references. Up to a few weeks ago, I could always say that the facts have never been openly challenged. Uh, there was a recent exception in London, uh, because I'm getting somewhat more publicity in Europe than I am here. The Soviet Weekly decided to counter uh, some of my arguments. It was probably forced to do so. Unfortunately, they picked the wrong example. They said I was wrong about the, uh, the Soviet Marine, uh, Merchant Marine, and the origin of its diesel engines. They said my figures and facts were wild. Uh, unfortunately for Soviet Weekly, this is one case where all my evidence came from Russian sources, so I pointed out to the Soviet Weekly, it's quite obvious that the Soviet right hand doesn't know what the Soviet left hand is doing. So let's get to the point. 